Great. Yes. How was the day? Busy? Uh, a lot of surgeries and patients? Yeah, busy surgeries. A couple of big surgeries today. Uh huh. Fantastic. So, what do you specialize in? I I saw your website and uh, I saw all the reviews, but I'm interested uh, hearing from you. Yeah, yeah. I would say, I mean, in general, we do a little bit of everything, but most of what I do is cosmetic surgery. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do a little bit of breast reconstruction as well, um, and then, you know, within cosmetic surgery, most of what I do is, is breast augmentation. Um, but I, I do a fair amount of um, other things. Like I mean, today I did um, two. Well, one one mommy makeover, but basically they were big cases. So we did a w massive weight loss patient. So somebody mm -hmm. lost a pound. So we did a breast lift, implants, a big tummy tuck that's a vertical and a horizontal incision. Uh huh. Um, and then some liposuction. And then the second patient was a breast lift, tummy tuck, and liposuction. So. Um, so for a minute, I would say, I guess body body contouring is what you would say, okay. you know, um, in addition to into breast. And, and breast is probably, I don't know, maybe 60 to 70 percent of what I do, of all kinds, you know, breast lift reduction. Mm -hmm. it's like, so. Awesome. Dr. Kerry just mentioned mommy makeover. Would you elaborate yeah. on that? Yeah, I mean, I think mommy makeover is um, something that's becoming a lot more popular, I think, for a variety of reasons. I mean, primarily because people want to have less downtime. So mommy makeover is kind of combining multiple procedures that you would typically not necessarily need unless you'd had a, a, a pregnancy. And so that um, is oftentimes some type of breast procedure with some type of belly procedure. So, I mean, it could be a real easy uh, breast augmentation and maybe some liposuction. Mm -hmm. uh, or it might be a little bit more involved, like that patient today where we did, um, you know, breast lift and maybe an implant and then uh, a tummy tuck and maybe some liposuction on top of that. So it could range anywhere from a case that's uh, just a couple hours to a case that's, um, you know, five or more hours all day. Mm -hmm. and, and really the idea is that, you know, people really want to maximize, maximize their results but minimize their, their downtime for recovery. Um, I'd say most my makeover people who at least have tummy tucks need a, need a couple of weeks off work. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it really allows them to get, you know, a few things done without, um, without having to come back later, mm -hmm. I guess. I'm sure not everyone knows what's the difference between tummy tuck and liposuction. Sure, right. And that's a big difference. So, um, you know, a tummy tuck... Basically, what we're doing is uh, we're always involving some some type of skin excision. With liposuction, it's just removal of fat underneath the skin, so underneath the skin surface. So liposuction involves very small incisions, um, typically um, just a few millimeters, mm -hmm. and can really be done almost anywhere on the body where there's uh, fat. Um, the tummy tuck is uh, obviously in the tummy, and uh, typically a uh, standard tummy tuck, we're removing all the skin and fat from the, basically from the belly button level down to kind of right above the pubic, sort of pubic mm -hmm. bone or air le level. Um, and, and that can be combined with a little bit of liposuction as well, but that, that's sort of the skin excision for a tummy tuck. And then a big part of a tummy tuck is actually what we do on the inside, which is what most uh, people, you know, see the results of being their, their tummy being flat, but don't really know sort of what the steps are. And so basically what we do is when you have a pregnancy, the, the two six-pack muscles basically separate apart in order to accommodate the baby. And so a big part of a tummy tuck is actually sewing those muscles together. So after we basically excise that extra skin, we then lift the remaining skin and fat up to kind of the level of the breast area, mm -hmm. and that exposes those muscles. And so underneath, everybody's got six-pack abs, you know. Um, and so what we do is we then sew those muscles back together, which allows basically almost everybody who has a tummy tuck to be flat, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, and then that also, when we separate that skin and fat from the muscles, that's how you're able to close that gap from that skin that we excise. And so we bring that uh, down and, and basically try and keep that incision, obviously, as low as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and then typically there's a small incision around the belly button as well. And that's the standard tummy tuck. And that takes mm -hmm. a couple hours, you know, mm -hmm. um, the same day, but most people need a couple of weeks off work to, to recover. Mm -hmm. And all other procedures, if somebody wants to do tummy tuck and breast augmentation, it's done in one day under one Sunday. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, regardless of whether or not you've, you've had a, a kid, I mean, occasionally we do have people who kind of have mommy makeover procedures, but, who, you know, haven't had children. So, 
Um, yeah, and they, they would do them the same day. So you could do a tummy tuck and a, and a breast augmentation usually in a little over three hours. Oh, wow. uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I have the same day. So. That's wonderful. So if a person is looking for a plastic surgeon, what do they need uh, to research? How do they find the best one? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that... Um, I, I, I think that the first thing is, is board certification. So you want somebody, and, and that can be confusing because um, uh, there there are lots of people out there who say they're board certified, but they're mm -hmm. not necessarily board certified in plastic surgery. I mean, the reality is, is that there there aren't that many true plastic surgeons in the country. There there may be I think around six six or seven thousand um, mm -hmm. board certified plastic surgeons in the United States. So it's really not a, a very common specialty. But if you look at advertising and you look um, online, there are you know a million people advertising as as being a board certified cosmetic surgeon. Yeah. So you know the difference is that I'm a plastic surgeon who does cosmetic surgery. Um, you know, but I'm fully trained in the full breadth of plastic surgery, and then and then board certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery, which is the only board that actually. Um, is recognized uh, by sort of the uh, there's like a, a society you know there's basically like basically like by the government mm -hmm. um, as being um, you know the only plastic surgery board and so that's the first thing to look for and, and I think that you know you want to look for somebody who obviously does the things that you're interested in right mm -hmm. um, and has pictures that you like you know, um, has uh, good reviews online, like you talked about. Yeah. Um, and I think you got to like them. So, you know, I mean, I think that there are, I mean, you can go to, you know, three plastic surgeons and get, you know, three good results. But ultimately, you want the person, I think, that you're going to relate to best, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that, you know, and, and is not always uh, me. I mean, and, and, and I think that that's, it's important to have a good relationship. And so that's, I think, I think key. Um you know, and then you want to look for someone who has the right membership. So, I mean, I'm a member of all the important Absolutely. societies. So, American Society of Plastic Surgeons, the American Society of Aesthetic mm -hmm. Plastic Surgery. And I think those are important when you're looking for a cosmetic uh, application because you want someone who does aesthetic surgery. And it's it's difficult to join those groups that are not something that you can just pay to join. Um, you have to go through a whole process and a review and, um, you know, have mm -hmm. uh, rec recommendations from your peers. and. And that's something that someone who sort of advertises as a cosmetic surgeon is not going to have um, just because uh, there's, you know, it, just, it doesn't exist. So I think that you got to look for certification. You want to look for membership to the right groups. And, and then you want to look for a relationship that, that is uh, that's good. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. If uh, somebody flies out of state to have a uh, money makeover or any other procedure, how long do they need to stay in Texas before they can go back? Yeah, that's a good question. I, you know, we have a lot of people that come. Um, I mean, Texas is a big state. So, yeah. I mean, we have a lot of people. I mean, on Friday, I did somebody who lives like seven hours away, you uh -huh. know. And, uh, and and I think that it, it depends on uh, on what you're doing. In fact, uh, the girl I did today li lives about five hours away. So, you know, uh, I, for a big procedure like a mommy makeover, I, I'm going to want you to stay in town for a while, maybe as long as a week. Um mm -hmm. If, if you're just having a breast augmentation, usually you can go in about 48 hours. Oh, okay. Uh, and, uh, and then we try and set up, for people who are coming out of town, we try and do maybe Skype or something, or we'll send pictures ahead of time and try and really get an idea of exactly what we're going to do. See, Make sure that we can get you a pretty accurate quote so you know what's going to cost before mm -hmm. the, you know, so you don't, uh, you know, you're showing up basically the day before. Um and then, and then really try and estimate, you know, how long do you need to be around? What, what are you having? How much help are you going to need? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's very difficult oftentimes to travel after surgery just because you can't, you know, you may not be able to get an airplane, but you really can't lift a lot. You know, I mean, you, mm -hmm. you may be in narcotics, you need somebody to, to really kind of, kind of be with you and, and take care of you. So, yeah, but I think it depends on, on, on really what you're doing. And it's something that we really customize on an individual basis for out of town patients. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Dr. Kerr, um, you mentioned you, da, you do all kinds of body makeovers. Do you also do face, like rhinoplasty and other yeah. procedures? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, have a, I think a particular interest in rhinoplasty. I think it's, it's, uh, it's a fun procedure. I think it's, it's challenging for me. It's not, um, you know, every nose is a little bit different. Um, and, and I think that there's a, I think there's a little um, heightened, um, what's the word, um, 
I, mean, I, I think as I think as a surgeon, there's you know operating on the face. I think is I enjoy it because it, maybe it's a little bit more high stakes. Like it's a little bit uh, it's 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 a little bit more technical. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, we do rhinoplasty, do facelifts, brow lifts, eyelids, mm-hmm. uh, really all that stuff. And that's when I'm not doing breast work. That's basically what I'm doing, and and that makes up you know a fair portion of my practice for sure. Um, when I when I came to Texas, I was actually recruited to Texas to do facial plastic surgery um, uh, by the by the hospital that I'm affiliated with, and and so um, so it is it is a big part of my practice, and it's something mm-hmm. that I really like doing. You know, I mean, I think the opportunity to change someone's face is um, is something that I don't take for granted, and is uh, is something that can be really. I think for filling. I mean, uh, yeah. I think more so than other areas of your body, your, your face makes a huge difference in how you present yourself and and how you show your age. And uh, and I and I think that um, facial plastic surgery is um, I, uh, something I really enjoy. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And um, do you have uh, mostly females in your practice or some males? Most, also? Yeah, yeah, sure, right. I mean, I would say probably. Gosh. I don't know, maybe 80, 80, 85% of my patients are probably, probably women, uh, you know, and I think that's related just primarily to those are the numbers you look at, yeah. you know, nationwide. I mean, there's not a, um, not a huge number. I mean, certainly growing of men who have, have surgery, but you know, for men, you're looking at facelifts, um, and then usually just body contouring, mm-hmm. you know, um, primarily liposuction, um, and men kind of really usually want to go after that inner tube area and then contouring of the chest. And, and that's something that we do, um, all the time. I mean, multiple, multiple men every month for that kind of stuff. But, Mm -hmm. uh, but in general, I would say women are are clearly the the most common. Interesting. Yeah. I've heard that, um, male population that interested in plastic surgery is growing. So (laughs) yeah, I I think, you know, you look at the plastic surgery numbers, they increase every year, and and that's, I think, really uh, common. You know, interestingly, we saw, like, a huge increase last year in men um, uh, seeking Botox, Uh which is kind of interesting, you know. So, I mean, I think that that, um, injectables like Botox and filler and stuff like that are kind of like the slippery slope of plastic surgery, right? I mean, so I think, you know, once men start doing Botox and start to like it, those people will ultimately transition to facelifts and stuff like that as Mm -hmm. they get older. So I think that with the baby boomer generation, uh, you know, aging, we're going to see an exponential increase in the number of men who are seeking plastic surgery, mm-hmm. uh, primarily facial plastic surgeries. I think what we'll see as those as those boomers get older. Mm-hmm. Interesting, yeah. Doctor Kerr, In your opinion, um, for Botox and fillers, uh, when is a good age to start? So maybe it's good to start earlier to prevent wrinkles. Or? Yeah, I think so. You know, I think probably not so much in the twenties, but for sure early thirties. I mean, some some people with their genetics don't do well. I mean, you can see how many wrinkles I can make. Um, I don't. My Botox is worn off. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think that you know usually early thirties, and I and I think that there is um, definitely something to prevention, especially for deeper lines um, in the forehead and around the crow's feet and in the glabella area, and that's you know primarily what you're going to get treated with Botox, and uh, you know if you have basically more or less always weaken that muscle you never have an opportunity to get those those lines that can i mean are really difficult to go away you know i mean when someone comes in for botox uh you know in their late 60s with a lot of sun damage and the lines are there you can make their skin smoother but you can never make those lines gone yeah. and those lines are so thin the fillers don't really work for them unlike you know they might work here and here you know or in add volume to the lips or something like that and so i do think that maintenance especially with botox plays a role and i think that early 30s is when most people should probably start Mm -hmm. fantastic so now i would like to ask a few questions about uh, you personally and what it takes to be a successful plastic surgeon because it's a lot of years in school and residency and practice so how do you manage uh, family and work and your your life (laughs) Yeah. So, um, yeah, my life's pretty crazy. I work a lot. Um, we, you know, we, we try to travel, um, as much as we can. So, I mean, in general, I take, I'd say between four and six weeks off a year. Um, but for the rest of the time that I'm here, I'm working all the time I and mean, I'm working right now. Uh, you know, I, I tend to, I tend to work a lot. Um, we do a lot of surgeries, um, you know, typically five to 600 major operations a year. 
um, which is which is a lot. Um, and uh, and I, I think that uh, plastic surgery for me, you know, even though I work a lot, um, I don't really feel. I mean, I don't feel like oh my gosh, I got to go to work. You know, I mean, I, re I really enjoy what I do, which makes the makes it seem a lot easier. Yeah, you know, I mean, I was in the OR today for. I mean, basically 11 hours, um, and I was tired, but you know, I enjoyed what I was doing, and uh, and I had a good time, and we listened to music, and I and it was it's it's fun, you know. I mean, I like I like being a surgeon. Um, as far as the family life, you know, my wife uh, works with me. Um, her name's Ashley, and she's my nurse, and she's a huge part of the practice. I mean, we see people on the weekends. Uh, you know, we see people after hours. I mean, she's um, definitely a big part of kind of us sort of living this life, which is really kind of eating and breathing this practice. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we, we started it um, five years ago, and um, I think that it's been really successful, I think, because it's a family, kind of it's a family business, you know? I mean, it's definitely, you know, and I don't have a lot of staff. I only have, I mean, in addition to my wife, I have basically three full-time employees, and I mean, if you will, if you, I mean, we'll see a lot of people. I might see us tomorrow. I'll probably see fifty-five people in clinic. Wow. But wow. each one of those people that comes in will, I mean, they'll know. Them. I mean, they'll know who they are because you know, and they'll know, and they'll know who my staff is. It's not like all of a sudden there's somebody different in the room with you. I mean, it's the same people all the way through. And so I think that that's, I think, really rewarding for the patients, but uh, but also for me because I enjoy that small kind of environment mm -hmm. and. You know, even though we're we're pretty busy, we're able to I think provide a personal touch for each patient, which I think is what what helps to set us apart. You know, um, from other from other people. The um, and then as far as uh, you know, how long it take it takes forever to get here. <laughs> this is, you know, as far as school, I mean, I think that that's that's important. I mean, I did you know four years of high school, four years of college, four years of medical school, and then six years of residency after that. Wow. Um, yeah, so it's it's a, it's a fair amount of training, and um, I was able to do a, a program which is uh, combined uh, plastic surgery and gel surgery. So I was actually able to start my plastic surgery sooner than most people would, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and yeah, something that uh, basically from the first couple of months of medical school was something that I knew that I wanted to do. So. Wonderful. So if you have a patient, uh, maybe uh, somebody who is a little bit more obsessed with their appearance, wants uh, to have a liposuction where they're not uh, supposed to have, uh, what kind of advice do you give them to... Yeah. yeah. That, that happens. I mean, we get a few people each month that aren't surgical candidates. And I, and I think you've got to be real clear with them. And um, I, I find that not so much with liposuction, but where I see that happening a lot is with rhinoplasty. Um, you know, for example, I had, I don't know, a few months ago, some lady come in and she'd had six rhinoplasties, six nose jobs. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I just looked at her and I said, yeah, and she looked pretty good. She did not look, I mean, normally if you got six rhinoplasties, you'll look a little like Michael Jackson. You will not look good, right? And uh, I mean, I think, I think that as a I think as a as a board certified plastic surgeon, you really have an ob obligation because there are people who will operate on this person, right? I mean, they have continued to operate on them time and time again, and I, I think that you have an obligation to really tell them, look, you know, it's not okay. Like you can't have more surgery. Eventually, you're going to reach a point where you're going to have a complication, or you're going to have something where you you can't go back. You cannot make it any better. And so, I think that it's important to sit down with people and really kind of show them what their realistic expectations are. Mm -hmm. If your expectation is, is that my nose is going to be just a little bit more up, the reality is that you're going to chase that forever and you're going to wind up ruining your face, you know, mm -hmm. or ruining your breasts or ruining your stomach. And and I think that, that you definitely have an obligation when you identify someone who's who's a concern to to really not not necessarily confront them but to but to to teach them that that, that they're at risk. And this is why, because a lot of people will just say no. And I think that it takes, it takes uh, somebody who, who really, I don't know, has, I mean, I, it, it, it takes the extra mile really to, 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 to teach that person why no. Mm -hmm. 
Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So, and we do that. We do it all the time. I mean, I, it's not just, you can't just pay money and have surgery. I mean, you have to, you mm-hmm. have to be a good candidate and you have to have, and you have to have an outcome that I feel confident in. Right. So if you want something, I don't think I can give you, I'll be real honest with you that I'm not your person. Yeah. Uh, or that, you know, if you want something and I don't think you need to have surgery because I think you look great. I'll be real honest with you too. I mean, there's a lot of people who are going to take your money, but I think it's really important to, um, you know, I mean, the one thing that I can't buy is my reputation. Absolutely. And, and I, and I think that, I think that by being, having a reputation as someone who's fair and honest, um, <laughs> is worth so much more than, you know, than the few thousand dollars you might make from a, mm-hmm. from one, one particular operation. And how long does the nose job operation procedure last? It depends on the person, right? So, I mean, it could be usually, usually I would say two to four hours, depending upon what we're doing. Uh Um, You know, um, I'd say the average pretty easy rhinoplasty is probably two and a half hours. Uh And what is the healing time? Um, So that's, it depends on what you do. So it can be, it can be longer than you'd expect. So I would say the average person looks pretty good at about three weeks. Uh Uh, But to that person, they're going to seem really swollen, right? So, I mean, their nose, to them, it'll seem swollen. But, you know, if you were at the store checking out with the, che- I mean, you they wouldn't know you'd had surgery, okay, you know. Uh-huh. Most of the bruising would be gone. But to you personally, it will look different. It will look swollen. And, I mean, and rhinoplasty can take over a year for the swelling to go away, especially in the tip. So, wow. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's something that you really got to be patient. And I think as a patient, seeing yourself in the, in the mirror every day, you tend not to notice some of the changes you know, versus when I see it three months and I say, oh, you know, it's a, it's a big difference to me from last yeah. time I saw you. And there's several visits in that first year, and I think it's important to, to, to be patient. And and, um, and that's for minor things. I mean, obviously, things like the bump and, and being the mo- nose being more narrow, th- that stuff is almost immediately visible. But it's the small changes in the tip that really take the time. Oh, okay. Well, that's, that's an interesting information. Is there anything else, Dr. Kerr, we didn't cover that's, that could be very important for patients, somebody who is considering procedures? Um, I mean, maybe we talk a little bit about breast augmentation, since it's the most common thing that yeah. I do. Um, you know, uh, you know we, we do several hundred um, you know, breast implant cases uh, a year, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a big part of what I do. It's, it's the most common plastic surgery procedure performed in, in the United States. Um, and typically those are going to be with silicone breast implants, which are now safe. Mm-hmm. They've been back in the market since 2006. And um, we're now using a fifth generation implant, which is a very thick gel. So when you cut the implant in half, it stands apart kind of like a piece of jello. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, implants going to last a very long time. Um the uh, but not forever, which is important. So you you probably get about fifteen years out of an implant. Uh, we use a Keller funnel, which is something that I've been using for a few years, which I think is a really a very simple idea, but has a really great effect on how I do the operation. Which is basically like a like a pastry bag that we load the implant into, and allows me to place an implant through a smaller incision, and also allows me to place it into the body without touching the skin, which can result in some sort of contamination issues. Um, the, uh, you know, breast augmentation in general is a pretty easy operation. Most people have about three or four days downtime um, and mm-hmm. then back to work. Um, and implants usually look pretty good by a couple of months. So, um, oh, wow. mm-hmm. so, so something that we do, I mean, really on a, on a daily basis, we're seeing lots and lots of people for, for breast augmentation. And I know nice to add a little bit of volume to your breasts to restore volume loss for pregnancy. Yeah. Um, you know, in our warm climate, it's, it's something that people like because, you know, we're in a lot of swimsuits here and, and sundresses and, yeah. uh, you know, can wear clothing that's a little bit more revealing and, um, mm-hmm. and feel good about it. So. Uh, when you mentioned uh, you use implants through a small bag, so you use a smaller mm-hmm. incision. So where do you make an incision? So there's a lot of places that you can make incisions. I, I would say most commonly... We're making a small incision underneath the breast, and, and, and that's for a variety of reasons. You know, the first one is that that incision is, is reusable. So, you know, implants are not lifetime devices, so when we're putting a, an implant in, we want to make sure that we're not having to make a new scar somewhere else, you know, in the future. Yeah. Um, it's the smallest scar, uh, which, which is about an inch and a quarter to an inch and a half, depending upon the size of the implant. Um, 
And then, you know, it has in general, I would say, the lowest risks. And also, if you're a younger girl, it shouldn't impact your ability to breastfeed, which, which is important to a lot of people. Yeah. So. Well, that's, that's great information. And um, in 15 years, when somebody uh, needs to replace the implants, do they just make an appointment? Or how do they know that it's time to replace? Perfect. Maybe it can last longer? <laughs> Yeah, right. So they don't get a uh, they don't get a, a a card from my office like you would <laughs> the Jiffy Lube, right? Uh, so um, the uh, so it's not so much that the implant has to be replaced, but I would say in general uh, you, you're reducing risk of having problems. So it's easier to remove and replace an implant that's that's fine and is just getting older yeah. versus waiting until the implant is having problems. Oh, I see. And mm -hmm. so you know if you're if you're replacing without problems, that's a 45 minute operation with very little downtime and also a whole lot less discomfort. Um, if you wait to have problems, then you know it could be potentially a, a much more involved operation. Mm -hmm. Um, the implants themselves actually carry a warranty for 10 years. So if you have a problem with the shell, the filling in the first 10 years, the manufacturer will give you f free implants and reimburse you for um, a majority of your, of your surgical costs. And um, so, you know, but just because the warranty is uh, run out doesn't mean that the, you know, the implant's not any good anymore. And so I think that when you look at the data, 15 years, I think is a pretty reasonable time expectation in that, you know, the, the chances of having problems are still relatively low, but are starting to increase as compared to, um, you know, something where you wouldn't want to wait too much longer, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Now, the only way to know for sure whether you're having a problem with the silicone implant is to, is to look with an MRI. And, um, and that's certainly something where you could be doing yearly MRIs, but the problem is, is the MRI is not going to say, oh, it's getting old. It's just going to say yeah. there's a problem. Mm -hmm. And so, again, waiting till there's a problem is not necessarily, I would say, the most, um, you know, the best way to, to, to manage it. So Absolutely. And if somebody is still skeptical about silicone and wants to uh, have an option of saline, uh, do you still offer those? Yeah, saline implants are absolutely an option. And, um, you know, maybe 15% of the implants that we place um, are saline. Now, typically they're in younger girls because the FDA wants you to be 22 for silicone. Um, although silicone can be used off-label in, in women less than, than 22, and we do that all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but, the, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, a saline implant definitely has its place, and, and I think that especially in somebody who has a larger breast, it, it can provide a little bit more fullness to the top, and, and, and the fact that it's a little bit more firm um, may not matter. Um, however, if someone's really an A and they want to be a, a full C or a D, I'm always going to recommend silicone because it's going to be the most natural look and feel, uh -huh. you know. And, and I think that I think there's really no better sort of um, uh, what's what's the word, um, you know, statement for how I feel about silicone implants, other than to say that that we we my wife had her augmentation done six weeks after the ban was lifted in 2002 um, with silicone gel, and we were waiting for that to get approved. And and I think that that's um, really a testament to how, to, to, you know, that I feel like the implants are safe because, yeah. I mean, I mean. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That's fantastic. Mm, well, is there anything else we should cover? I think that's, I think that's probably it. Oh.